What's up guys? Straight from the chest, Wednesday Wrath, and my name is Justin Groth, and I am your host on this beautiful rainy day schedule Wednesday. And who loves rainy days? This guy, love him. Love rainy days, don't know why, but I always have. And guys, on this rainy day schedule, we're gonna have a very interesting talk. It's interesting to me, I've been wanting to share this topic with you all week, or at least since Sunday, since the last podcast. And guys, for those of you who are new to the channel, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank all my veteran listeners too for listening and, and giving me their ear. It means a lot to me, guys. But if you're new to the channel, I wanna inform you of something upfront. This is a personal development podcast, and this is centered around igniting the true potential that lays sometimes dormant within you. And it's hopefully my job, well, it's my job, I feel, and hopefully you gain some perspective from the words that are coming out of my mouth, and hopefully you can apply some of these things to your life and they deliver value to you because that is the only reason why I even speak on this podcast. That's it. One reason, you. So without further ado, guys, we're into the segment that I call We're Not Friends. And guys, this is... a uh, this is the, this is a I feel this is this is just ridiculous. I don't know why people do this, but we're not friends if you don't wash your hands after you take your trash out. We're just not. In fact, I don't want to shake your hand ever. If I see you take out your trash and then you go into your car, that's how I know you don't wash your hands, right? If you take out your trash to the street and then I see you get in your car, we're not friends. That is the most horrific thing, I think. No, I can think of other horrific things, but that's up there. That's just like top tier, man. Like, because if you're not washing your hands after you take the trash out, what other things are you doing that you don't wash your hands after with? I mean, that to me is just like, I can't do anything. I'm literally handicapped. My hands are handicapped after I take the trash out. Their hand, I can't touch anything. I have to touch things with my elbow or my forearm until I get to a sink and I use that antibacterial soap, you know, the this, this stuff that cleans you and takes all the germs out. Until I get to that, I can't touch anything. I'm literally disabled in my hands. My grip is disabled. But not you, you get right in your truck and you get in your, <laughs> you get in your truck and you leave, you're touching your steering wheel and your door handle. Oh my gosh, man. It's a catastrophe. And, the, and I'm speaking from experience, clearly. I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about somebody here. I'm talking about my neighbor. He'll never hear this, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> but even if he did, I'm cool with that too because he should know that that's not cool. You don't touch your trash and then go to your, and, Touch anything else until you wash your hands. Maybe this is gonna resonate with some of you because I bet some of you do this. And I hope that I just changed the, the, the dynamic for you because it should be changed. If it's not changed, it should be. You should be washing your hands after you touch your trash can. What's wrong with you? Seriously, man. So we're not friends if you don't wash your hands after you take the trash out. Ridiculous. Guys, to the message, this is important. This is something that I've been wanting to talk with you about all week. And I even pondered getting on the podcast yesterday and doing another one before I, but I didn't because I worked and I hate that I had to work and not podcasting. You know, I like to podcast all day long, every day, right? But no, truth be told, I, I do love my job. I love to train people and that's, that's my career. That's, that's, well, that's what I'm doing right now, right? That's the season I'm in right now and I love doing it, but I do love this as well and it's, it's the driver behind why I continuously get on here and speak to you guys because I, I feel like maybe you could use some of this information too and apply it to your life and if not, that's okay too, right? It's not gonna be for everybody, but I wanna put this number in your head. 242, and I want you to remember that number. Now, we're going back, and I'm gonna backtrack a little bit, but guys, I know that in your life, there's been people that have told you, 
or that told you that your idea sucked, for lack of a better word, they tell you it's not going to work. They tell you that vision isn't something that you should, you should, you should really try for because it's not going to work. It's never been done before. That's something that's, you know, too ludicrous. Just forget it. Just get a nine to five and just go about your life until you retire and you have a pension plan and all that. And then you die. And that's kind of the safe way to live. That's not kind of, that is the safe way to live. But you have something within you, something like a burning desire within your gut to want to to want to do this thing that's that's calling your name. You feel like it's calling your name each and every day, even though it's a it's a whisper. It's just saying, do this, do this, do this. And but you keep suppressing it because you want to live safely. And we understand that the safety factor is comfortable and the safety factor is predictable and the safety factor is going to give us re uh, a retention plan. But the safety net shouldn't always be there. The safety net you shouldn't have to fall back on. The safety net sometimes can be your dysfunction. The safety net sometimes can keep you from actually pursuing the destiny that God placed inside of you. Guys, let me tell you something about, let me, let me give you a little bit of a context here. A lot of times the safety net is the devil in disguise. The safety net seems like it's the pragmatic thing to focus on. But see, the enemy loves the enemy loves to keep you comfortable and he loves to keep you just going enough to where you're not really making any headway, but you're not falling back either. Have you felt like that? Because I know I have. And a lot of, a lot of times we think that if we're riding just barely above the safety net or if we catch a safety net, we're good. Right? We didn't fall too far beyond and we're not getting hurt proverbially. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not uh, damaged. We're not, we're, not, we're not taking too much of a risk that we're for. We're not losing a lot of money. We're not losing a lot of patience. We're not stressing out a lot. But that can actually be the dysfunction that causes you to never, ever reach your full potential. Ever. And guys, the, the person that guards that safety net is the enemy. I really feel that. I believe that God is provoking us to do something that's beyond our human capability. But see, in order for us to make it come to fruition, we need to interact with God. We need to join forces with God so that he and I or he and you can make that thing work. But if we still stay below our, our means and we just live within our means and we don't ever really touch the safety net, but we know it's there, we can actually miss out on so much in life and not just in life, but what we're called to do. 242. 242. 242 people Howard Schultz spoke to before he got a $1.6 million investment in the 80s for his coffee company, which you know now as Starbucks. 242 people, 216 of which said, you're crazy. It's not going to work, Howard. Forget it. How many of you would keep going till you see 216 people that have all told you no in a row? Most of you wouldn't get past seven. Let that sink in. Most of you wouldn't get past seven. But he couldn't stop. He couldn't. And most of us would really rationalize that maybe God is trying to tell us something here. 
after 200 and some people and we still can't get funding. Maybe God's trying to tell us, dude, you got to take this thing behind the barn and shoot it. Because it's not, it's not going to go anywhere. I got, maybe I got, maybe God's trying to tell us, we got, he got better plans for us. He's got bigger things to do. And there's a reason why this isn't working after 200 people. But he kept going. 216 people said, you're crazy. I'm exaggerating it, but they said it didn't work. They said it's not going to work. Quit wasting your time. But he had no other choice. He couldn't and didn't want to do anything else. And he kept going and he kept asking and he kept going from person to person. Because let's be honest, you go through 200, you go through 100 folks, you're going to keep going. Let's just be honest. If you've not given up after 100, what's 900 more? What's 1,500 more? If you keep, if you have 100 people tell you no, most of us couldn't take 100 criticisms that, that end up nowhere. Most of us could not take 100 criticisms and be okay to keep going. Most of us would just pummel at the fact of 100 criticisms on our character. And this guy got 216 no's. No. No, 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 no. That's insane. And he kept going. He eventually got funding from about 30 some people or what was it? 30, 20 some people to say, yes, I'll give you funding for this. So where he could make his $1.6 million mark so he could keep his coffee shop open. But that's relentless at its finest. That's relentlessness. And I'm not, I'm not advocating just being relentless. I'm advocating being relentless in the belief over your gift, over your desire, over the purpose, over the constituent that God's put inside of your gut, not your brain, your gut, not your heart, your gut. You can't live without doing this thing. It's in your gut. It's in your gut. You have to do it. It's not a, it's not a, it's not an option. Nobody can tell you, you can do this or you can do that or you can do this. You have to do this other thing. It's that, it's must, you have to do it. There's no negotiations. And you are going to see giants. You are going to see adversaries come in your direction because guess what? In those situations, when you have a gift, when you have a purpose, the enemy hates you for it and he doesn't want you to capitalize on it and he definitely doesn't want to get you in agreement with God and aligned with God because he knows when those two forces join God and you it's over it's over and he has no chance and he hates that because he knows there's going to be more people coming to God through you for what you're doing through God you see that reciprocal reciprocation there between you and God and how it works but that's how you get into your purpose. That's how you become aligned with what your God-given gifts are to establish your legacy on this planet through God and through listening to your gut and what he's talking to you through the Holy Spirit, through your gut with. But you have to believe in the times of trial. You have to believe in the times of tribulation. You have to believe in the times of these giants and these adversaries coming at your doorstep and saying, you can't do it, dude. You're not capable. You're right. You're not capable alone. But you and God in a marriage, you're capable. But it starts and it ends with the belief and with the desire, with the ignition in your gut to bring out and extract everything that God's laid in there, dormant, it may be dormant, but it's there and it's your job to extract everything and pick up your sword that has your name engraved on the blade and slay each and every dragon or giant that says you're not capable. You can't do it. You can't. You don't have the measure. You don't have the goal. You don't have the strength. 
You're, you'll pummel at the, at the side of, of, an, of, a, of an altercation. You won't have what it takes. You can't do it. Slay him. Slay him. And don't slay him at the chest. You slay that giant at the head. Because you're really slaying all of the critics. All of the critics that were sent to you by the enemy to destroy the gifts that God gave you. Slay them. Slay them good. You go for the head. Just like the enemy does with you, he goes for your head. You slay it. The giants and the adversaries only mean that you're on the precipice of a breakthrough. That you're at the door of an opportunity. So you need those giants because then that tells you, it reassures you that you're on the right path. It reignites you. It gives you strength to power through each and every giant, adversary, naysayer, critic, because they do not define you. The person that defines you is God, and he's already equipped you, and he's already called you, and he's just waiting. He's just waiting for you to pick your sword up and slay with him. God didn't give you things for you not to uncover. He gave you things for, he gave you talents to uncover and to impact and infect, infect the world with. If Howard had given up, let's be honest, it wouldn't be the worst thing that happened if we didn't have coffee on this planet, but it kind of would be. <laughs> if Howard gave up after a hundred people if he was regular, if he didn't believe in the battle that he was going through, if he didn't still believe during the battle, we wouldn't have Starbucks. And if coffee not being the worst thing if we didn't have it, or a bunch of coffee chain restaurants that, that if we didn't have any of that, that wouldn't be the worst thing. But I'll tell you what, Starbucks has benefited small business owners to provide and support a family and a community of people and employ them. That is probably the biggest thing that we would have missed out on. Multiple job and career opportunities for people, provisions for people's families, etc. So Starbucks is a good thing in terms of what it does for other people and how it provides for other people and the opportunities that are there for other people. If Howard didn't keep fighting, we wouldn't have that. There's another man that believed even when he had nothing. He wrote himself a $10 million check. Let me just let me just back up a little bit. Most of you, myself included, would never be audacious enough to think that I'm gonna cash this $10 million check one day. $10 million is a ridiculous amount of money, especially in the 90s, when this all took place with this, with this guy. 10, can you even imagine taking your checkbook out and actually, <laughs> Not a joke, writing out legitimately 10 million for services rendered to yourself. And then not only that, not just doing the, making the action happen, but then actually believing that that is going to come to fruition one day. That's insane, 10 mil, that's insane. He believed that he would be able to cash that one day. And he's 
waiting. He's waiting, but he's not waiting. He's not just waiting on the on the opportunity to happen. He's working. He's working. He's working. But that in time, the years are going by and that check is disintegrating in his wallet, but it's still there. He doesn't take it out and trash it because he's like, well, a year went by and nothing happened, so whatever. Or even though he post-dated it for 10 years out, eight years went by, you would think that you would probably lose some belief or some in or some encouragement after eight years and nothing happened. You most of us would forget about it after three years. And he kept it in his wallet as a reminder, as a token of not only his belief, but of his value and what he knew laid within him that he was capable of acquiring. And not just the, I'm not talking about the money itself, but the actual position or the breakthrough that he'll step into if he keeps his faith and he keeps expecting it to happen. Nine years goes by. He finds out that he's going to make $10 million on the award-winning movie as we know it today, Dumb and Dumber. That guy was Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey. 10 years pre, postdates a check for 10 million. Not because he was arrogant, not because he felt he deserved it, but because he knew that if he kept going and he kept believing amongst his battles, during his storms, during his trials, that he would get there eventually. That's why he kept that memento in his wallet. It was a reminder, look, I know I'm capable. I know I'm ready. I'm getting prepared right now, but when that day comes, it's gonna all make sense and it's gonna, it's gonna all unfold and that's gonna be worth it. And I'm worth it because I know that what I'm doing, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing. I know that where I'm at, I'm supposed to be. And I know it's only a matter of time, so I'm gonna keep this as a reminder in my wallet And nine years after he dated that check, he finds out he's making that exact amount of money on Dumb and Dumber. Insane. But it just goes to show that you never give up your belief in or during the battle. And if you have giants and you have adversaries and you have naysayers, then you know, you know you're on the right path because you have something that's within you that's absolutely extraordinary. And anybody who tells you different, anybody who tells you different just doesn't believe in themselves enough at the point where they can just turn to you and just demolish your dreams too with them. They just don't believe enough themselves, but it's not their fault. And I don't think they were, they were giving your way from the devil. I'm just saying it's not their fault. They don't understand the greatness of what's in, that's within them. And so they have to bring somebody down in the process, but that doesn't define you. That is not who you are. You, I, all of us have extraordinary positions that we're about to unfold and we're about to achieve in our life. But we have to keep the belief barometer high. We have to understand that the giants and the enemies, they're a part of the process. We need them to level up. We need them. I need critics. I need people telling me that I don't know what I'm talking about. I need people telling me that you don't need to be doing this. This is what you need to be doing. I need people telling me that even if they're my closest kin, I need you telling me that because that's how I know that I'm on the right and straight trajectory 
towards a realm that I can never manifest on my own, that I could never orchestrate on my own. I need you telling me those things. I need you to breathe that disbelief down my throat. I need it because it's what I need to level up because it's how I know that I'm right where I'm supposed to be because I know in my gut, in my gut, that where I am is right where I need to be. There's a peace with a fire. There's a peace with a fire in my gut. And I still have that sword that's got my name engraved on the blade and I'm ready to take my giants by the head. <laughs>